Hi, how you doing? In this video, we're going to look at seven phrases that have found themselves in common use that you might not know originally came from historical English martial arts, either boxing or wrestling. We're going to start with possibly the most obvious, and that's the gloves are off. Back in the days before the Marquess of Queensbury ruined boxing by banning grappling and making gloves compulsory, things were a little different. Training, sparring and friendly competition was usually carried out wearing large padded gloves known as mufflers. The first record we have of them being used was by Jack Broughton who created what a lot of people consider to be the first set of formal rules for competition. Those rules stated clearly that serious fights, championship matches and other top level battles would be carried out bare knuckle. Fighting without gloves was a sign of both how good you were, but also how serious the fight was. And so when things got serious, the gloves came off. The second phrase comes from exactly the same period, and even the same person. In the centre of the boxing ring, two lines were drawn approximately one metre apart. If the boxing ring was in an indoor arena, then these might be chalked or painted onto the floor, but for fights that happened outdoors, in impromptu rings in public houses, theatres or public land, lines were simply scratched into the dirt. At the start of each round, fighters had to walk to the centre of the ring and stand on their line or scratch. If they were unable to come up to scratch, they were considered a beaten man or woman. Throughout history, different areas of the UK had their own styles of wrestling. In many of them, a specific way of taking hold was compulsory. In Cumberland and Westmoreland wrestling, as in Scottish backhold, the participants take an over and under clinch position and lock their hands together behind their opponent's back. In Cornish, and also in Devonshire wrestling, a special jacket is worn that you use to grip. However, in some of the more brutal styles, such as Lancashire wrestling, there was no specific way of taking hold. No holds were barred. The phrase, no holds barred, was later adopted by professional wrestling pioneers of the early 20th century in order to give their bouts a supposed sense of legitimacy through the act of allowing any type of grip at all, however dangerous it may be considered to be. Nowadays, it simply means that anything goes. In the Georgian period, when pugilism first began to grow in popularity, fights were often reported on in local newspapers and other publications. By the time boxing was established with both the commoners and the gentry alike in the 1800s, a man by the name of Pierce Egan had developed a reputation as the first ever sports journalist. He was already making a decent living as a writer, but rose to fame mainly on his accounts of fights of the day. His work was published in a number of places, but drawn together in a series of books called Boxiana. His descriptions of fights were so detailed, he was said to give a blow-by-blow -blow account of each round. Nowadays, a blow-by-blow -blow account is simply considered to be unusually detailed. If someone always seems eager to do stuff that the rest of us think is unpleasant or simply very difficult, then they're often called a glutton for punishment. Yet, like a lot of others, this term originally comes from boxing. In the early days of boxing, two characteristics were prized more than any other in fighters. Firstly, their skill at boxing, their ability to strike without getting hit in return, their ability to move and avoid their opponent. This was known as science. The second attribute, and probably the one prized most, was a fighter's bravery their ability to get knocked down and get back up again, their gameness, if you like. This was called bottom. A fighter who had vast amounts of bottom, but not an awful lot of science, was known as a glutton. They could take everything they were given, and more besides. They were, quite literally, a glutton for punishment. When you have somebody on whom you know you can rely, someone who will offer emotional, physical or even financial support should you need it, you may think of them 
as being in your corner. Clearly, this is another boxing metaphor. When a fighter stepped into the ring, they were assisted by their second. This person would hold a towel for them, provide them with drinks during the breaks between rounds, and in the early days of boxing, even drop down onto one knee to allow their fighter to sit on their leg to get much needed rest. The first set of codified rules of boxing stated that the only people allowed into the ring, besides the umpire, were the fighters and their seconds. But during the rounds, the seconds must stay in their fighter's corner. The combatants literally had somebody in their corner. In traditional Cornish wrestling, the winner of a bout is the fighter who causes their opponent to land flat on their back. If the shoulders and hips are considered pins, a two-pin fall would be worth more than a one-pin fall. Three or four pins on a fall was known as a back and won the fight. Rather than just leave this judgement up to the competitors, each fight would usually have three people whose job it was to act as a judge of whether a back had been achieved. If they saw a back, they would raise the sticks they held high into the air. These judges were known as sticklers, and their job was to enforce the rules. The phrase, stickler for the rules, is still in modern use today to mean someone pedantic or unwilling to negotiate. Those are my favourite modern phrases that originate from historic English martial arts. Are there any that you're aware of that I've missed? If there are, stick them in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more recreational violence related content. And for those of you still here, at the very end of the video, fight team.